In this video, I want to conclude our discussion of maximum likelihood estimation of factor analysis models, and that's going to lead us on to talking about the fitting function, which programs like LISREL actually use to estimate the parameters. Okay, in the end of the last video, we derived this form of the log likelihood, and just to be clear, I've included in this constants term here the log of the 2 pi, which we derived in the last video. And I've just included it as a constant here just because of the fact that constants included in the log likelihood don't in general affect the position of the parameter estimates or the maximum likelihood parameter estimates that is. And the idea is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with a matrix sigma which estimates S as good as possible really. And the idea is that we need some sort of parameter to optimize over so what we do here is we write that sigma, our implied variance covariance matrix, depends on theta, the parameters of our model. So on that basis, what we could then do is we could differentiate our log likelihood with respect to this parameter theta. And then what that would give us is it would give us, if we set that equal to zero, the maximum likelihood estimates of the parameters in our variance covariance matrix sigma. But in general, that's not what statistical software programs do. They do something a little bit different, but it kind of amounts to a very similar thing. So instead of maximizing this log likelihood here, what we actually do is we minimize something which is known as the fitting function. So I've written that as FML here to indicate the fact that we're talking about the fitting function with respect to maximum likelihood estimates. So this fitting function in terms of maximum likelihood is equal to the log of the determinant of sigma minus the log of the determinant of the sample variance covariance matrix S, plus finally the trace of the matrix S times the inverse of sigma, and actually I've forgotten we need to also include on this the number of parameters P. So P represents the number of observed variables. Okay, so there are some differences between these two expressions which I should go into. The first is that we've removed this sort of n dependence up here. And the reason we've done that is because n actually doesn't influence the maximum likelihood estimates. And to see that, essentially what we'd have is we'd have a term which had the sort of log of sigma and the other one with the trace. And when I differentiate that, they both have still got n in them and we're setting this equal to zero. Hence, we can just divide through by n. In other words, n doesn't affect the position of the maximum likelihood estimates. And another thing that I should mention here that I haven't made clear is that we are actually replacing S in this top expression, which is an unbiased estimator of the true population variance covariance matrix for the indicators by a matrix S, which is being corrected for this bias. And it's been corrected by dividing through by one over N minus one rather than one over N when we actually do the summation. And it turns out if we do that, this S down here actually is what we refer to as an unbiased estimator of the true population variance covariance. Another thing that we've done here is we've included this term minus log S and this term here minus P, as well as dispensing with all the other constants in the log likelihood. So why are we able to do that? Well, because of the fact that these are just constants, constants when you differentiate disappear Hence, they don't actually affect the position of the maximum likelihood estimates. The final thing which we've done is we have essentially taken this whole thing which was just negative and we have times it by minus one to get something which is positive. And because we've times it by minus one, we are going to be minimizing this fitting function rather than maximizing the log likelihood. Okay, so why have we actually done this? Well, what we're actually trying to do is we are trying to come up with our best estimate of sigma which is supposed to estimate the sample variance covariance matrix S. In general, if we're talking about over-identified models, which we'll explain in later videos, sigma doesn't in principle equal S, because the idea is that we can't necessarily explain all the variance and covariance of our indicator variables by our factors. But we can think about what would happen if there was actually a perfect fit. So if we did find that sigma was actually equal to S. What would FML equal in that particular circumstance? Well, what we would have is we'd have the log of the determinant of sigma minus the log of the determinant of sigma, because I've just replaced S by sigma here, plus the trace 
of sigma times sigma to the power minus 1, and then finally minus p. Well, this first term here, these first two sort of logs, are obviously just going to cancel one another out, so they disappear. And we're just left with the trace of sigma times its inverse, which is just the trace of an identity matrix which has dimensions p, because we're talking about p indicator variables. And then finally, all we need to do is we need to take off p from that. Then if we think about what the trace of an identity matrix of order p is, it's just going to be p because we've got p ones along the diagonal. And then we finally take off p from that, which leaves us with an fml value of zero. So this provides a little bit of intuition as to why we've actually created this thing fml as we have done here. Essentially, when we have perfect estimates of the sample variance covariance matrix S, then fml equals zero. In general, sigma is not going to equal S and fml is going to be above zero, but at least we know that if there was a perfect fit, this thing would have a particular value of zero. And I just want to make the point here that theta actually represents the parameters of our model. So, for example, that might represent the weights to which the factors load on certain indicator variables, for example. So, the idea is that programs like LISREL make an initial guess at theta, call it theta zero. From that, they then calculate an initial implied guess of sigma. They can then use that to calculate fml. On that basis, they then change theta slightly. And the idea is they change theta in order to decrease fml slightly. And they basically continue with this process of changing theta, which changes our estimate of sigma. And the idea is that they stop when, essentially, between iterations, sigma isn't getting any closer to s. So the idea is that they look for convergence of the predicted matrix sigma to the sample variance covariance matrix s.